1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up a sword against nation, and nor will they train for war any more. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And Philippians 4. <clears throat> I plead with you, you Dia, and I plead with Sintish to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Father, we thank you for these encouraging words. We thank you for the work our pastors do throughout the week to minister to us. We thank you for the time Crystal spent in study and in prayer and in thought. And we ask now that you would bless her as she teaches us what she's learned from you and strengthen her and ourselves for the hearing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Get settled here. Well, it's good to be back, and I do want to thank you all for your prayers for me and Al as we traveled, and we had a great time with the kids, and uh, especially getting Serena graduated. So, again, thank you for your, your prayers and all your kindness to us and our family. Our theme today is peace, the third in the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And many of you know that I'm a procrastinator, especially when it comes to writing my sermon. So yesterday was set aside for, so, yeah, thanks, Al. <laughs> How come he can't agree with me like that all the time? <laughs> Don't get it. Anyway, yesterday was set aside for sermon writing since I'd only gotten about one paragraph done by Friday. But we Christians have an enemy, so it will not surprise you to hear that with every intention of writing something about peace... Saturday morning, I was not afforded peace. While I was still preparing to get started, you hear procrastinating still, a notification came on my phone that a certain church I follow online was um, streaming live. So first, I want to give you a little backstory on this. On Sunday morning, she went off on a bus back to Indiana, but we had concert tickets that night, so we weren't leaving till Monday. So we had a chance to visit this Anglican church called Church of the Redeemer. We enjoyed it, and I found out that they did a weekly podcast of their sermons. 
So for about seven years now, I have been listening to Father Thomas McKenzie fairly regularly. Besides his Sunday sermons, I have listened to his Wednesday evening classes that he gives from, from time to time. So yesterday, when I saw the notification, I wondered, well, why are they live on a Saturday? Why today? I had the vague thought that it might be someone's funeral, and since I don't know anyone there, I thought I'd just take a quick look and turn it off. When I looked at the video, sure enough, it was just prelude music that was going on for quite a while. So I went and looked at their feed on Facebook to see what I could find out, and I was shocked to discover that Father Thomas himself and his 22-year-old child had both been killed in a car crash last Monday. They were on their way to take Charlie back to school. It may seem silly. I shook the man's hand one time walking out of the sanctuary. I didn't know him, but I grieved when I heard the news. I thought of the wife and younger daughter left behind. I thought of a whole church reeling from such a tragedy. But I genuinely felt sorrow for myself as well. Father Thomas was just a little younger than I am, just 50 years old, and a little bit out of the box for a pastor. He preached the gospel faithfully, but he was a little bit casual in his delivery, very open and honest, even a bit irreverent, you might say. He said things like they saw them, didn't beat around the bush. There are a few times when I wish I could email him with a question or a comment and maybe have a little back and forth with him, but I never did. But over the years of listening, because of his style, I felt like I knew him. I still can't believe I won't hear any new sermons in his voice and with his distinct style anymore. I wept as I watched the memorial service, participating from thousands of miles away. And all the while I was thinking this, on the day I'm supposed to be writing a sermon on peace. (laughs) And I don't dispute the Bible's promise that we can have peace even in the midst of storms, tragedy, and death. But if we are to have it in those times, it will have to come from God, who is the God of peace. If I ask you to imagine the word peace... What picture comes to your mind? Now, I know we don't do this often, but go ahead. Tell me out loud. What what are you picturing in your mind when you think of the word peace? Dogs and hippies? hippies? Okay, that was not what I thought of. Oh, dove. (laughs) What else? What's laying down? Guns Guns laying down. Okay, good. Absence of war, war, definitely. Serenity, calmness. Okay. A chair sitting calmly on a rough, turbulent ocean. Okay, all right. I thought of, um, you know, some things that are from nature, like a a calm water or or flowing stream, a beautiful sunset. How about a sleeping baby? Uh, Presidents of two nations shaking hands or a person at prayer. How about some sounds? What do you think of, what are are the sounds you hear that are peaceful? A beautiful piece of music. Child sleeping. Yeah, child sleeping. Waves hitting the shore. Birds singing. Birds singing. Yeah. Yeah. The crackle of a campfire, a family reading stories at bedtime. Siblings playing nicely together. <laughs> we can imagine it even if we've never heard that. <laughs> Usually we do think of peace as the absence of war, but the Jewish concept of peace, called shalom in Hebrew, is more like these things that we've been talking about. It's a concept of well-being, of health and being whole or complete. It's complex, something with a lot of parts all fitting together. Peace is a really important concept for the church. 
In our worship service, we sometimes pass the peace, usually following the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. It's an acknowledgement of the peace we have with God and with one another through our relationship with Christ. At the end of the service, we are often sent out with a wish for peace, something like go out into the world in peace. And sometimes we are even welcomed with the greeting, grace and peace be with you. It's important for the church to be at peace with God and with each other. Over and over again in Paul's writings, he says Christ gives us peace. And since peace, that wholeness and well-being, is desirable, if people find it here within the church, they're more likely to be, want to be a part of it. Of course, peace in the church does not mean any lack of activity or a lack of caring concern for others' lack of peace. In fact, peace in the Bible is accompanied by other qualities or actions. For example, in the list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, where we get this present sermon series, the fruit is singular with nine qualities. You could say nine facets of the same fruit, the first three being love, joy, and peace which are often named together or in some combination of them in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, righteousness and peace kiss each other, and justice is a frequent precursor to peace. So a peaceful church is an active church, full of love and joy, justice and righteousness. The church in Philippi must have had some disturbance of the peace. Yodia and Syntyche, two church leaders, were in disagreement over something, probably having to do with how to do the gospel in Philippi. With them at odds, the whole church would have difficulty functioning well. Remember, we're one body with many parts, complex, and those parts need to fit together well with no gaps, no one missing, no malfunctions. When things aren't working together well, Peace is absent and the whole is broken down. Paul pleads with the women to come to one mind and with others in the church to help them. He wants the church to be complete so that the gospel can be preached and practiced and the kingdom advanced in Philippi. And then he begins to close his letter with a charge to the congregation, including the promise of peace. But peace comes after or as a result of the other practices, specifically celebration, gentleness, and prayer. In a culture that was accustomed to celebrating all of the gods, Paul urges the church to publicly celebrate Jesus, strengthening their faith as they worship him. But this should be done with gentleness, not out-of-control carousing. Gentleness is another facet of the fruit of the Spirit, so we will talk about it later. But suffice it to say that we can have genuine rejoicing and celebration and gentleness at the same time. Paul also wants the church to be people of prayer. In Philippi, Christians were experiencing suffering and persecution because of their faith in Christ. And I know I'd be anxious if I were in that situation. Paul wants them to replace anxiety with prayer, telling God what they want and need and being thankful to him in every circumstance. Then the peace of God will guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word guard is actually a military word, so it's a bit ironic that God's peace will surround their thoughts and emotions like soldiers protecting their territory. However, it is peace, not weapons, that are guarding them. The Philippians' bodies may have been in danger from the persecution they were experiencing, but their hearts and their minds could have God's peace as they depended on Jesus in prayer and worshipped him in celebration and imitated his peaceful, unanxious character. Doubt and fear arise in our thoughts and feelings sometimes too. These are a call to prayer. 
They are opportunities for us to express our needs and desires, faith and thanksgiving to God, and experience a peace that goes beyond what we would think should be normal or available in troubled times. I'm sure you can think of times in your life or in others when it seemed like all hell was breaking loose around you, and yet you felt calm and undisturbed. It's not wrong to feel that. That is the God of peace present with you. Our Old Testament passage also tells us something about how to receive peace. In it, the nations are streaming to the Lord willingly and eagerly so that he can teach them his ways. Anticipating his teaching, their intention is to walk in his paths. That's what righteousness is. Learning God's ways or what he's like, how he operates, what he wants, and being eager to be like that and want those things too. Isaiah says God will judge between the nations and settle their disputes. And after that, they will turn all their weapons into farming tools. That contributes to the definition of peace as more than just the absence of war and rather wholeness. When things break down or parts are missing, peace is gone and needs to be restored. When God, who knows our thoughts and motives and is always fair, judges between people, relationships are restored. And justice being done, now we can not only not train for war, but we can work together for something that is productive and life-giving. We beat our swords into plowshares. We stop seeing others as our enemies and work instead for their good as well as our own. If the path to peace involves practicing joy in the face of persecution, prayer and thanksgiving instead of anxiety, righteousness and justice in the place of selfishness, no wonder peace eludes us. We are attached to our anxiety. I don't know, it doesn't really feel good, but it's a pattern we're familiar with, worrying and talking things over and over, sometimes eliciting pity from our friends. Being anxious is a way of keeping the attention on ourselves. On the other hand, prayer just sounds too easy, like, what do I have to do, right? We always want to do something to try and help ourselves fix it. Praying and giving something over to God seems too easy and even risky. He almost never does things the way we would do it, left to our own devices. And we know in our minds that's good, right? He's God, we're not. But when we're waiting for an outcome, trying to not handle things in our own strength, it can feel like laziness or ineffectiveness or weakness. So in difficult or fearful situations, we may want to hold on to our anxiety rather than trade it for prayer and the resulting, if eventual, peace. Neither is rejoicing in Jesus, especially publicly, always easy. Some of this is personality, but for me, it just doesn't feel natural to wear my heart on my sleeve. I do love Jesus, and I think the community the people in the community know it, but I don't make a big display of it outside the congregation. I guess that's why we need the church. Together we have courage and can do things we wouldn't or couldn't do alone, including celebrating the Lord in the larger community. And of course, righteousness and justice are often not things we cultivate eagerly either. Righteousness is that bit from Isaiah where the people learn God's ways and walk in his paths. Well, our ways have gotten so backwards from God's that his ways look strange and foreign. To the world who aren't trying for righteousness, ours looks holier than thou, or ignorant, or irrelevant. While those are false interpretations, God's ways are actually holy, the most intelligent and extremely consequential, we must exercise faith and courage to keep on course, often in the face of opposition from our culture. 
What looks to the world so peculiar is the cruciform shape of our lives. As Jesus gave his life on the cross for us, we give ours for our neighbors. It's hard, it hurts, but it's never wasted in God's eyes. It's effective. And justice, well, I don't know about you, but the hardest part about doing justice for me is that I am the one of the ones on top. I have plenty of money. I'm well-fed and healthy. I enjoy a certain amount of respect and prestige, at least as far as I care to. To work for justice for others might mean getting uncomfortable and giving up some of what I enjoy. It might mean admitting that my lifestyle contributes to the oppression of others, that my comfort comes at the cost of someone else's well-being. But without justice, there cannot be peace. They go hand in hand, and the church needs to be aware of injustice and work to make it right in Jesus' name. God will settle disputes. That's what Isaiah said. He does it through the church. And like I said, peace in the church isn't inactivity, sitting passively by and waiting for God. At least sometimes there's part of that. And of course, all we do is in partnership with God. But we are called to do justice, to act on others' behalf. And where justice is, God's peace will also be. Like so many things in this life with God, peace is something we both work for and wait for. We cannot manufacture peace on our own. Peace comes only from God, who is, after all, the God of peace. But we can cultivate practices and attitudes that allow God's peace to thrive in our life. We go up to the mountain. We seek the Lord. We decide in our hearts to walk in his paths. Mainly, we respond to his call with an eagerness to be in his presence. And so it is fitting that we call it a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, as Christ lives in us as we walk by the Spirit, peace comes as the natural outgrowth of his presence. Peace, especially in the Isaiah passage, is connected to righteousness and justice, doing God's law as a result of being taught by him and agreeing with his just judgments. But our righteousness comes from our faith in Jesus Christ and by the faith by which he lived and died for us. So it becomes something that isn't about following rules or laws externally imposed or working hard in our own strength, but simply living with the awareness of Christ within and in accordance with his character and desires. He writes his law on our hearts. With the Holy Spirit of Jesus living in us, we are changed on the inside into people who do rejoice in the Lord, who recognize anxious times as calls to prayer, and who go there with requests and thanksgiving. We become the kind of people who work for justice because we see Jesus there and want to join in with what he's doing. And we will have peace, even when things are hard or uncomfortable or downright dangerous, because the God of peace is with us. Both the Old and New Testament passages depend entirely on the presence of God. In Philippians, everything is in the Lord and centered on Christ who is near. In Isaiah, the mountain of the Lord is exalted. We go to him. He teaches us. It's his path we walk on. God's peace prevails, and the people give up their weapons. Don't you love the picture of people beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks? I mean, what if that really happened, that we forget all about our conflicts and weapons and put all our resources into food production, clean water systems, health and education and transportation and parks, and all of those good things that people need for well-being? for shalom. Of course, this will never happen until Jesus comes. 
but we could start small, start with ourselves. What are the weapons that we use against others? Sarcasm, a position of rank or power, possibly coupled with a loud voice, violence, disdain, silence, Will you go to God and allow him to teach you his ways of gentleness and humility, of preferring the other over your own needs? Because if you will, he will write his law on your heart, the law of love for God and love for neighbor. It's no longer a matter of following a set of rules, but a matter of being so enamored with Jesus that what he does, you do. What he wants, you want. The way he thinks, you think. There is a way to please God, and it's not a matter of you being good enough. It's a matter of cultivating that relationship with Jesus so that you become the kind of person who ordinarily lives according to his law. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen.